already been discussing Shiddle Buddha Kudu all the time. It struck me when listening to one of Leslie Buddha's recent podcasts where she said there comes a time when those of us that are attending meetings must start turning what we're listening to into action. It was on Sunday the 15th of February this year when I came up with the idea for the One in Five campaign. It was the very next morning that I decided to email Nicola Sturgeon. Within a three week period, all six political parties that have represented us in Hollywood have signed up to that campaign. But for someone who was somewhat politically ignorant as recent as a year ago, to start a campaign that unites all six political parties in the midst of a really competitive general election, I think that's pretty decent. Like and join us. How many of us demand that our politicians give actions not worthy? How many of us have mentioned bears not bombs and horses not nukes? And for those of us that are in the SSP, SNP or Greens, on the doorstep when we're campaigning, how often do we quote the thirty billion pounds worth of cuts versus the hundred million, sorry, hundred billion pounds on private renewal? How many of us are reaching out beyond that echo chamber? Could one of us here this evening, that's new to politics, have chaired tonight's meeting. Instead of the second half of tonight being a question and answer session, you could be utilised the experience of John and Kat to create a cow CND in the quest for a nuclear disarmament within Argyle and Butte. Just think how useful that group could be, especially with the demilitarisation of the Holy Land. It's my view that when we, the people, start leading by example, others will be more likely to join us. Just look what's happened here with Castle Tilt. That campaign is inspiring a community group where I live in Edinburgh. It's for these reasons that I look forward to attending my first Baslane blockade on Monday the 13th of April. I want my words to be backed up by action because it's through actions that we can start to make change possible. Do now what you want the future to be. Thanks, Jamie. Jamie's just going to throw a wee bit of at this point. Um, just before we go to, to John, uh, I was just thinking as Jamie was speaking there that um, I've, like most people I suspect in this room, have come in a, a process here, a political journey, from being in the Labour Party and the Liberals many, many, many years ago, when the Liberals were a then through to being a member of the SSP. But throughout that time, um, nuclear weapons have been a very big part of my life and lots of other people's lives in the room for the reason, the very good reason that we've had such a large number of our doorstep for so many, many years. So it doesn't, for me, it doesn't matter which political party I can represent it. Nuclear weapons are just a matter. And at the time of financial constraints, um, such as we have now, um, it makes even less sense to have them. So I was introduced to John Ainsley of the CND. Um, John's been the coordinator of Scottish CND for some significant time. Um, you can degree understand in international relations, and that's a number of reports, some of which I've read in papers, particularly on Trident. And Trident, of course, is what all the mainstream political parties at Westminster, other than the SNP, want to replace one way or another. So, with that, I'll pass it over to Johnny. Thanks. I'll just wait so I can operate this thing here. Um, before I start, um, just when I, I left the office, before I left the office, there was a new poll that was coming out, and this is a video poll asking what policy areas people felt were most important, and there were 22. And the top ones that people felt that these were things that people wanted to see happening um, was increasing the minimum wage and uh, increasing pensions. And then went down and down. The bottom one was replacing crime. So this is the most recent thing. It was actually commissioned by BBC Guy that way, I'm so sorry. The, the thing which is the bottom of people's list as to what they think should be happening is actually replacing the wins. Um, if I start with the illustration that we did in terms of, of talking to children in schools, 
If you imagine a small amount of explosives, about the amount that's in this glass, you have high explosive for that sort of quantity. If you have it in this room and it detonates, um, then that's going to cause lots of casualties and, and fatalities within this room and level of destruction. If you then scale that up a bit, imagine you have one of these large container lorries, that's about a 40 ton lorry full of high explosives. That's a colossal amount of damage that causes. To understand the just simple scale of high explosive equivalent in a giant warhead, what you have to imagine is 3,000 of these lorries, bumper to bumper, which is about the equivalent of all the way along the M8 from Glasgow to Edinburgh. That's the, when they talk about a, a nuclear weapon with a 100,000 tons high explosive equivalent, that's what we're, we're talking about, huge extent of it. Um, but that's only really part of what nuclear weapon is, because it isn't just a big bomb. It's also scattered radiation and the, all the effects that you get from radiation, both in terms of immediate and, and long term. Um, so one tribe warhead is, is equivalent to around seven Hiroshima bombs, and it's about 140,000 people killed in Hiroshima in 1941. So, uh, the tribe system, you've got these submarines and missiles on them. So each missile has several warheads. Average is five, they actually don't they're highly classified, so they don't see what the figures are. But a single missile then causes five of these nuclear explosions of the sort of scale that we're talking about. One submarine carries 40. Warheads. So you then, a submarine can bring about 40 of these huge nuclear explosions. And the, the British system today is basically geared around three armed submarines. So what you have, well one's at sea, but in the total force they have 120 nuclear warheads ready for being fired. So there will be target plants that target 120 nuclear warheads detonating within a period of about 10 minutes when, when they land. Take about 20 or 30 minutes to target the infrastructure, but they would all be timed to get the almost simultaneous. So the scale of that is just absolutely horrendous. Um, I did a study for an international conference on talk about human bodies, but looking at what would happen if those warheads targeted on Moscow. That's just part of it, which is looking at um, 20 warheads detonated at specific targets within the city of Moscow. The blue areas are basically the pretty well 100% fatality zones of around about a mile around each explosion. And the orange area is the fire damage area. And there are small fatalities of fire. But the, the level of, of, of damage that, that you get from that. I mean, Moscow is the second largest city in Europe, population of 11 million. Um, in that sort of world, you're talking about 6 million fatalities, um, men, women and children. It, it, and, and that's almost certainly that is what these things are known about. That, that came out from Medicare and Medicare and Medicare. Um, So we, we've just gone through this process with the referendum. So in the referendum, we had this opportunity that maybe we could get rid of nuclear weapons. What we heard, particularly from the Labour side, was no, 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 all you're talking about is moving down the road. Jim Murphy was at it again last night. I don't want to move to the north of the road. The interesting thing for me is this comes from Labour politicians. It doesn't come from the people who know about it. I, I happen to have a contact for a nuclear policy officer in the MD, a very good cool type, but he'll go and think exactly why we need them, and I'll go and think exactly why we don't. So I ran and passed my sort of arguments about it not being moved, because I've been arguing that it's not violent, and he basically did fit. He's a retired former nuclear mm -hmm. policy officer. And um, this is a statement from former commander. Um, Mark Dalbars and Pan Lane, who basically said it's almost inconceivable to be built past the end of the Cold War. And the other one is a chap who fell from Dalton, who's now an SNP councillor in Glasgow, but he was a submarine officer. And again, in just from his experience, that this thing of, oh well, we'll just move them down, we'll just move them down there, it's horrendously complicated. Maybe it can't be ruled out completely, but the people in the know say this is extremely difficult and probably impossible. But yet, it not be another thing. Oh no, no, I don't, don't just want to move down. So, so basically, it could not hear. Britain would probably have no um, What I basically feel, we had this big opportunity in the referendum, and it's really disappointing, and we were making a big case that that was our one chance to get rid of them. But there's a, the, second, now the second chance isn't really as good, to be honest, in terms of this election coming up. But nevertheless, time is a big issue. We can make a big of it. The reality of what we have is that tribes are sort of thorn in the side of the body politic of Scotland. 
if we elect a bunch of MPs who are strongly against Ireland and yet then they go ahead and renew it, that's only going to make that whole so worse and antagonising. So it, it is, you know, the referendum was people's vote can count and there's a sense in which this other vote is not quite the same scale, but nevertheless, that the votes of individuals can make a difference. And we don't have to just acquiesce to give the weapons driving through the centre of Glasgow. I've followed these convoys the last couple of times through Glasgow. Um, this is so the transport of both say, between four and eight nuclear weapons um, through the Midland City. Um, and we don't have to just look away and think that we should run around and, and sky, you know, we can actually stand up to these things. Uh, John Murphy talks about our independent nuclear deterrent, and, and both these independent and deterrent are nonsense. Trident's American system, all the components are American, detailed work I've done, the nuclear warheads themselves, there's three of the key bits of the nuclear warhead that I purchased off the shelf from it. You got that out a couple of years back. And the other detail work I've done is about software, because it's not just an hardware, the software is a bit, so you don't hang on, and we actually use it ourselves anyway. <laughs> um, declassified files from, from the early 80s, when they were applied and trying. Independence means 12 months supply of spare parts. That's how it's defined in the official papers. So we can operate it for 12 months, and then it just starts withering away. Um, and in fact, because of the software dependence, it's probably far quicker. But they, it relies on, on data every 24 hours from the state. So um, if America pulls the plug, then actually the, the system certainly becomes very inaccurate quickly and probably becomes completely unblockable within a matter of months or 12 months or so. Uh, one of the big issues that you use now, and we hear quite a bit on the streets, well, what about Russia? You know, do we not need these things because of Putin and what he's doing? Um, and I, I'm certainly concerned about sort of Russian intervention in Ukraine and so forth. But you have to say, what would it have been like if there were still nuclear weapons in Ukraine? It wouldn't have stopped the position. If you can imagine the scenes in Crimea, where you had units, military units, what side are they on? Tell you on this side or that side. You have militia, you have special forces. There used to be nuclear weapons here in Malaclava. Um, if there were still nuclear weapons in one of these bases, and there's this ambiguity, which side of these are, are they on the Russian side or the Ukrainian side? That's going to make it better, no it's not. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon put it very well quite recently, basically adding nuclear weapons to any situation. Um, why do we have all these arguments about reasons that are, are, are really superficial? The reason Britain has nuclear weapons is because of status. This is what uh, Tony Blair said in his biography. Mm -hmm. Giving up nuclear weapons is too big a downgrading of our status. That's always been the argument. If you look through the archives in the last 50 years, it's always about Britain's place, particularly Britain's place relative to France and Germany. You know, we're, we're big players in Europe. The, the idea of France being the only nuclear weapons power, that's unthinkable. You know, it, it's very much in that sort of big boys' toys area. But interestingly, that's not an argument that they can, that's what's behind it, but they can't always say it. Um, the chap called David Broucher, who was the British Disarmament Ambassador, and he was interviewed by the Defence Committee, and he was absolutely damning this. Britain needs nuclear weapons to have a seat on the Security Council. And this former British Ambassador basically said, this is a pernicious argument. Because if you say, we need nuclear weapons to be a big power, you are saying to every country in the world, if you want to be important, what you need to do is apply to nuclear weapons. So it, it doesn't stand up at all. It's, it's not only something that we should be doing, it's the wrong thing to focus on, but it's also setting completely the wrong example. Um, Hans Blix, if people remember them from the Iraq war days, Hans Blix said for us to be talking to Murphy and others, it's like smoking a big pack cigar and telling your children not to smoke. Um, Jim Murphy's line, you know, maintaining the UK independent must be part of the effort to use multilateral disarmament. He said something very similar last night, I actually very much this, yes, we multilateral disarmament. Well, of course, we've got to spend <coughs> we'll the place, they said. Um, and they said, so long as we live in an uncertain world, we need nuclear weapons. So in other words, for human beings develop the ability to predict the future, then we would need nuclear weapons. Um, insurance policy in an uncertain world, that's the other one that they trot out. But basically, as an insurance policy, this is a con man tricking you 
into signing up to this insurance policy. It's completely useless, it's very expensive, and doesn't actually provide any cover for the real threats, you know, that people are worried about cyber warfare and terrorism and climate change and everything else. This is completely irrelevant to all men. Um, jobs is another one. Um, we've got the jobs figures in FY request a couple of years back. Um, 520 civilian jobs directly in line of crime. Um, we can do work with the SGC about how to, how to address the jobs issue, so we can come back to that what's going on it. Um, at the end of the day, it destroys jobs. Use the same amount of money for something else, you create more jobs. Um, this fundamental issue, nuclear weapons are a deterrent. It's something that is stated, but it's not something that is, is any proof of. You know, you know scarecrow, garlic, hanging garlic outside, all these other things, they, they might be a deterrent, they might work. Um, <laughs> The, the most damning critique of this came from a chap called Lee Butler. Lee Butler was in charge of all American, operational command of all American nuclear weapons at the end of the Cold War. He's actually the guy who signed off the things to get rid of thousands of nuclear weapons at the end of the Cold War. And he must have been letting the fact that he didn't strike out more. Because there, there was a lot of disarmament in, in certain 1991 he was in charge. But, and he, he talks about it in um, theological terms as a faith. They're all sort of conducting it in his faith and, and they believe it all. But since he retired, he came out with absolutely damning statements about it. The deterrence, in Cold War terms, was fatally flawed. It was a dialogue between the blind and the deaf. Basically, Russia and America were thinking two different ways. So the idea that they weren't thinking the same way. Um, I, deterrence is just a politic, it's just a, 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 a word of things that people repeat. Um, it's semantic cover for them. And the last bit they came out with, uh, which was about sort of post-war, they clinged to deterrence, clutch its hand and promise to the rest, shake it wistfully at bygone adversaries, and bail for it you or imagined once. Um, and, and Lee Butler was very recently giving a speech to an international conference, so he's, he's still saying the same things. What we're faced with now is not just carrying on with what we've got, but building new submarines with decision in 2016. The MPs we elected in May then make this decision a year later about new submarines. Um, this is a very interesting one. One of the standard lines is all we are doing is replacing the submarines. We're not building new nuclear weapons, no nuclear missiles. Uh, this is a speech given by the head of the program in 2007. That was the first version I got that was redacted. So, like the, the tensor spray. I challenged that in the FOI and they didn't actually release it. The intention is to replace the entire Vanguard class system, including the warhead and missile. So that's what the head of the programme said in 2007. Yeah, you still get people saying only the submarine, and Ruth Davis a couple of days ago was saying only the submarine. You know, it's not true. Um, that's a rough breakdown of the time scale we're talking about. So we're, we're part of the way through. Uh, the whole thing started in 2004, the new new And once I've got the new submarines, I've seen a projection which basically has the date of 2067. That's when they would say the withdrawal of service. So we're really talking about 50 years. Um, apart from everything else, they're, they're spending 21 billion pounds at the moment in all this. That's not <coughs> picked up very much. It's all the rest is a billion a year at the moment that they're spending, completely rebuilding all of the nuclear weapons facilities. Um, the annual spending of nuclear weapons used to be around a billion a year. It's now about three billion a year, and then it will rise to four billion a year. <coughs> and then if you look at the through life cost of the replacement system, you're in that sort of 100 billion. You know, for several years I've been doing various studies that come up with 100 billion, so I can't just work out. But it's of that order. And interesting, when it was first been said, it's been challenged, folks say, no, no, you're exaggerating. But 100 billion is pretty well accepted now. Uh, but what's the real cost? What's the alternatives? Basically, 100 billion pounds, you can see today 3.3 million cancer patients. And I'm actually a uh, patient of cancer esophagus, so I, mean, I know my own treatment is extremely expensive. Um, so that's proper treatment for, for millions of cancer patients with that sort of money. Um, or dementia was another example 116,000 dementia patients uh, every year for 50 years, both healthcare and social care. Uh, well, a lot of other, you know, the jobs issue, well, instead of these people that get paid at the moment, you can be paying the wages of 77,000 nurses for 50 years, or about 60,000 teachers for the same period of time. Um, and this is a comment from a Douglas Alexander, 
fairly recently, and he was being pushed by Andrew Mark, who's lost my sense of time now, but it was last weekend or the one before, but it's quite recently. And Andrew Mark was saying, What are you going to cut? What are you going to cut? And he came up with a couple of things. One of them was, was the um, entitlement for pensioners' benefits, if they're, if they're better off. But the other one, which I'm not cutting China about it, but I put the ceiling, you know. And he was clearly, if he wanted to say we'll reduce spending, the youth went to consider it. You know, Mar was given the opportunity, but what he said is we're basically going to put these limits on child benefit. So Douglas Alexander, as the campaign manager for the Labour campaign, is saying what the priorities, problems, and not Um Just to finish on, on a more positive note, uh, this is a group of folk at an international conference <coughs> in Vienna last year. Uh, the one on the Left hand side is Rebecca Sharkey from the, the International Campaign for Getting Nuclear Weapons Space in London. Uh, Angus Roberts of Bill, Dan Slavia, who works with me, who is still with Conference, and Bill Kidd. So we have we've had several people from Scotland attending these international conferences. The first one was in 2013 in Oslo, the second one in Mexico, and there's a third one in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And they've had between 120 and 150 countries attending. The first two the P5 countries, Britain, America, Russia, China, France, boycotted. But the initiatives coming from non-nuclear weapon states, so non-nuclear weapon states are saying, uh, we want to look at what the effects of this humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. We are going to gather together and look at what the effects of these things are. And the conclusion being, we can't possibly respond adequately. The Red Cross, everything else, we can't respond to what happens in the nuclear explosion. But what has happened is that process has moved on. So the Vienna conference, is basically came up with a pledge to say that um, they should move to ban nuclear weapons. So there is currently a concerted international move to prohibit nuclear weapons. Now the countries that sign up, so about 50 countries have backed that Austrian pledge. Now the movers is Austria, South Africa, um, Brazil, there's a number of countries that are playing a key role in it. It may well be what will happen is they will sign a treaty saying we are banning nuclear weapons. We might not have any, but we're banning them, with a view to then leading to prohibition, which is what happened with uh, landmines and cluster bombs. That first of all, you ban them and then you eliminate them. So th there's actually a, a very positive international dimension to this. And so the, my feeling is that Scotland isn't alone in saying um, we want rid of these things. Scotland is actually in line with what most countries in the world want. It's the people who you know, we think it's being in a sort of normal status quo, but in have, they're, the, they're the odd ones out. We are actually the, the normal people. Um, and we can sort of do what we can to try to get that message across. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, given the fact that there are a lot of numbers, given the set bit, would you mind, would you mind that? If people ask any questions that they wanted just now, well things are fresh in their mind. Okay. Yes. Um, surely it's a simple thing that England will never give up nuclear weapons. Never, ever, ever. They've got a problem with the base here. And what the military people are saying is basically it's really difficult to move them. So, and this is why it was a key issue with the independence argument, because if Scotland's independent, bottom line is we can say we don't want to be the to go. As an independent country, we could do that. That, that was the, the argument of the referendum campaign. We hold the Arsenal, England presses the button. We have plenty of Scots who are capable of captaining subs. Any sub anywhere in the world, plenty of Scots, ships, captains, who could easily do the job. Well, I think our position, and, and you know, not just sort of firstly in terms of the SNP and, and most of the independence movement, is, is we don't want we want rid of them. Um, and I think the thing is that, the, that we can actually, certainly in the independence context, we can do it. Um, we can certainly kick up a fuss about it in this context of a Westminster election and, and how we turn out peace. Actually, achieving it is still a pretty big ask within that context, but within independence, it's definitely achievable. We like all people, right? Okay, yeah. um, just, I think the information John that you gave um, on nuclear weapons, you know, how many are on subs, and these subs pass a lot of our houses, and 
Um, I don't think that information is out there. You know, I don't think people understand that actually um, the amount of what was it, 140 in total, um, and that they are actually trained on particular cities in the world. And there was a lot of information in your presentation, and I just wondered how you get that out to. We certainly put it online and things, but it, it, there's a limit. I, I, certainly, in terms of getting things out of the media, it's slightly odd. I, I work with Rob Edwards quite a bit, who's a journalist at Sunday Herald. Mm -hmm. So, we can get stories about various radiation leaks and safety things, get that out, but sometimes getting more basic things out is, is harder. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, you get some sort of eye as to what, what's good, what the journalists consider a story, which is sometimes more difficult, you know. So actually communicate more basic things. Um. Sorry, John. In your, your presentation, you mentioned about the convoys coming through Glasgow to, to supply fast rain. Is the, the the fission material actually manufactured in England? Yeah. So in terms of the, the production stage, what you've got, all the mass in itself makes a plutonium pit, which is a, a sphere of about size of plutonium, which is the centre of the warhead. There's also a second bit which is high radiation, which is the diffusion stage. They are so the, the fissile material is made of uh, processed all the mass and there's a plant a couple of miles down the road for Bufffield. What they do there is to put the high explosive around it and assemble all the, the parts. And what you end up with something about that high like a traffic code is what the actual complete warhead is. And then those complete warheads are what travels through central Glasgow. Um, they can do minor monitoring and placing some of the components at Google. So they, they can do some work at Google. Can I ask a quick question on numbers, John, just before we go to Kat, I've got a longer question and answer later. Um, I remember that the old party committee from last year that decided that in principle they wanted to go ahead with the replacement, they costed it at four billion a year and gave a lifespan of 40 years, giving a total of 160 billion pounds. Um, it, it stuck in my mind at the time, and in fact, we used that very number in a number of posters that we did during the Yes campaign. Is that wrong? You're probably putting inflation through that. Well, that's fine. So that's the, <laughs> <laughs> there's a different way to do it. If you're starting to create inflation, what they call out-term costs and things like that, then, then you get even higher figures. That's, that's probably right. Okay. okay. Okay, thanks. We'll come back to some further questions uh, later. I'd like to introduce to you uh, Kat Lloyd on my left, co-founder of the Radical Independence Campaign and a trade union activist who's actually been here in Argyll today, uh, being an activist. Is that right? Um, and she was one of the main speakers at the event Saturday in Glasgow, but presumably not the one that was introduced as the most dangerous woman in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> so over to you, Kat. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, and like you said, I was uh, speaking at the, the, the rally on Saturday in Glasgow on behalf of the Radical Independence Campaign. And it felt like quite a significant moment for me, particularly in that square, because that square for me represents a lot of the times that people have stood up together for what's right. It's when I remember going to see Nelson Mandela being given the keys to the city of Glasgow. I remember that moment with my mum and dad. I remember sitting down on the street outside the square itself during the anti-war movement against the illegal invasion of Iraq. And it was really significant. I felt that, again, here was people standing up for what was right. And that's the place and the city that I live in that centres your focus. It's a space where you can start to dictate the political narrative when you have enough people there to say there's an alternative, there's another voice. And I think that the turnout shows that something quite spectacular is happening in Scotland and that the referendum may be over but something has changed forever. And Saturday's demonstration is the the first in a series of actions that are called by the Scrap Trident Coalition. And Saturday was the first opportunity we've had this year to say that. It's this one word that I keep hearing after the referendum. And it's small and it's quiet, but it's so powerful. And I think it's enough. 
that's the feeling that I get on the streets, that's the feeling I get when I'm out speaking to people, is that people are saying enough of this, enough of the way things are. And at the last Radical Independence Conference, um, when we closed the conference, we left people um, with, with a vow. And we called it the people's vow, because we still don't accept that the politicians who made their own vow on the front of the daily record had ordinary people's best interests at heart. And one of the points in our people's vow <clears throat> was the following. <clears throat> We will not let politicians or their friends in NATO use Scotland as a dumping ground for nuclear weapons. And if politicians fail to act in 2015, we will be part of an intensive campaign of civil disobedience against Trident. Yeah. And that was the promise that we made at that conference with 3,000 people at it. And that is what we're going to do. There's a huge gulf in the opinions of politicians at Westminster and ordinary people on the issue of Trident. John's already outlined that, that this is not a priority for the majority of people. And on Saturday, when we said enough, it felt like there was more force behind it than there has been in a long time, and that there's more hope in front of us than there's been since the referendum. And I feel like I've had enough of politicians constantly saying there's no alternative to austerity when you know that those submarines, how much they cost, how much will be poured into them as ordinary folk are bearing the brunt of austerity. And for me, Trident is a symbol of Britain's economic failure, where successive governments have cared more about providing space and shelter for their nuclear weapons than they have about providing homes for their citizens. And during the referendum, and you know, Jim Murphy's already been mentioned probably far too often time already, so apologies. Um, when he was the um, Shadow Secretary for International Development at the beginning of the referendum campaign, he said this, getting rid of Trident will be a fatal blow for Faz Lane and cost thousands of jobs on the west coast of Scotland. That's really what Jim Murphy thinks. And whenever he goes in Scotland, I want someone to remind him of it. What he conveniently leaves out of that sentence, what he conveniently seems to ignore, is all of the evidence, all the work that people like John have done, showing like, the report the CND working with Scottish Trade Union Congress on a report that categorically shows Trident costs jobs, the amount of money and resources that go into that pull from other parts of the economy and Trident industrially makes us worse off. The UK spends more than all but three other countries in the world on its military capabilities. These arguments for me are solid, they're absolutely sound and the economic case for getting rid of Trident is so obvious, especially at a time of austerity. So if the economic case is so solid, then why haven't we won yet? And this is what I've been thinking about since Saturday. Because for me, I think that this will never, ever, ever be about money for the British state. It is not a question of economics for them. Seeing Doug Douglas Alexander happily capping child benefit rather than cutting nuclear missiles. It's not about pounds for them, it's about power. That's what it's really about for them, and that's where we need to challenge the question of Trident. Because it's not about keeping us safe. We know that Trident doesn't provide security, because what we need protected from is extreme free market ideology from people like George Osborne, from people like David Cameron, from the feeble opposition of the Labour Party. These are the things that we need protected from, not phantom enemies abroad. And what's going to make people feel safe it's a decent social settlement that doesn't stigmatise them or discriminate against them. What makes I, I speak to people in workplaces all the time who tell me that what would make them feel safe is having health and safety legislation enforced or a decent wage or not a zero hour contract. That's what provides security. And Trident, like I said, it's about power. It's about the UK on the international stage. And Britain has been an aggressive global player 
illegal war, backing dictatorships, support for apartheid states. It's slavish adherence to the special relationship with the US. And that seems quite overwhelming at times when you think of the history of Britain, its role internationally, all of these things. But for the last two years, when we all worked together, we all stood united and went out and campaigned together, we had the establishment on the back foot. We had them on the back foot. There was chaos, there was panic. And the, the real core of power in Westminster, we had all the leaders coming up and panicking and all the Labour MPs up to see Scotland one last time. <laughs> yeah, I actually can't help myself. <laughs> but this is the point, is that something has happened in the last two years that actually does give us great traction in Scotland to challenge Trident. And I think it's really heartening to hear that there is other things happening internationally, that there's, there's a sea change there, but we've got a huge opportunity. And I'll finish on this because for me, this is a democratic issue. It's a democratic issue because this is a pure distortion of democracy. Like how warped do things have to be to spend more money on nuclear weapons, to keep your seat at the table of the boys club? How long? That is just, this is a democratic issue. It needs to be challenged like that. That's how we should be speaking about it. This is about power and democracy. And during this general election, the Scrap Trident Coalition are encouraging their supporters to vote for <coughs> candidates who say no to Trident. And in this general election particularly, it, it's like no other that we've had, because it's combined with what's happened in Scotland and people waking up to what's going on and this huge crisis of legitimacy at Westminster. And I think that we've got a new opportunity to challenge that cross-party consensus that says private is necessary. And I'll finish where I started. And that was on Saturday it, when it felt different because we'd protested before. I've been on anti-trident demos before and I've been through the blockades before, but something is different this time. I think that the information is starting to get out there, but I agree with you, I think we need to do more to get these facts and figures out. But the process that we've been through through the referendum means a renewed opportunity to do something different in May. And I think we're closer than we ever have been to winning on this issue. First, on the streets and in communities and in workplaces, but also at the political level as well. And I really <coughs> hope that you'll try to come to the blockade on the 13th on Monday. Because I think we want to send a loud and clear message that we don't want Trident in Scotland's waters and we don't want it in anyone else's either. I think that's the message that we want to send to people. And I really believe that the days of the British state's nuclear weapons system are numbered. And I think for me, and radical independence, now I'm not a member of any political party. I don't see my role as being in a political party that's in the general election. Because for me, there has to be a moment where we say, this is a red line. And yes, the SNP have been driving this issue, but we need to make sure there is no room for a U-turn. The pressure on whoever we elect to go down to Westminster is going to be colossal. And we need to make sure that we are ready to say, this is not up for negotiation. There is no way that that can happen. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us to do something quite special next month. That we can say enough to nuclear weapons and that we can win. And that that win isn't just a victory for people in Scotland, it's a victory for people the world over. I'm always reminded that that's uh, the big building there contains enough more heads to kill seven million people. So it's very much in the forefront of my thought. But I think it is something that a lot of people in Cowell are very concerned about. We had a public meeting in December, which a lot of people said, why don't we have 
a, a CMD a group in Cali which can campaign about that. And I, I hope there's kind of enough energy in this room. It sounds like a lot of people would like to do that. Before we do that, though, there is one question that I, I, I'd like to ask because I think we are united about the idea we try to must be stopped. But I'm still unclear about why, um, if we get rid of Trident, why an independent Scotland would stay in NATO. NATO is a nuclear deterrent based organisation. Mm -hmm. Someone says it exists to defend its members from the results of its own action because it's actually an aggressive organisation which causes a lot of problems for the defence mm -hmm. It's based on the American nuclear deterrent, and NATO members are therefore hanging on to that. What's the point? We can move it from Toolport, but they're still then within the US nuclear shield. I understand that the SNP supports staying in, in NATO. To me, it's illogical. If we get rid of the tribal, we should also leave NATO. I'm like wondering what the speakers think. But trying to promote the I think the impetus was coming from the MPs, thank you so much some of the MPs, who then live in this Westminster bu bubble, or who not being a member of NATO, how, how can anybody possibly think about not being a NATO? It's just, you know, I, I think there was some set out of touch with, with most of the feeling of the party. The other thing that was behind it was James Mitchell, who also had done a, did a survey of SNP views, and that would appear to indicate that SNP membership was willing to abandon that stance of NATO. But at the conference itself, and in the run up to it, you certainly got the feeling that it was Justin. Because, and I, I, I don't know this, but I suspect that Nicola and others were very keen that he did sign up to it. On the assumption, I think, that it just it was really wasn't being contentious. But what actually happened, as far as I mean, you know, we, we were all around right other time, it was very close. I don't think they would have gone down that road. If they'd known it was only going to be passed by a few votes. And because, as <coughs> Kat was saying, membership has shifted, I'm thinking they don't like it again, they didn't have any trouble. But the, the difficulty is that in the party, they might not want to have that discussion, you know. Can I just comment that as one of those who opposed the move on the day, uh, along with a number of other members of the SNP branches locally, uh, I was. I just thought it was astonished at the way the vote went. I didn't actually think it was going to go that way. But I also think that there are dangers in a much enlarged party in that you just don't know what way it might go if it was put to the vote again, particularly to a vote of all members. That's the worry I've got. Yeah. I was going to say, <coughs> I didn't have long debate by so on. I think it was all rather more grubby than any of that. Um, I believe that via Norway, what came from the US, that any intervention of the SNP to deny Scottish membership of NATO would result in America taking a position against Scottish independence. And I think that's what the grubby deal in actual fact was. I think that's what it was all about. And I think that's what the McGrath thing is all about as well. I like 
What's the question on the nuclear issue then? Question? Mm -hmm. I would love to know when this, when cats, uh, uh, what do you call it, cat? The, the blocking. The blocking. The blocking. When it has, when it has. It's on Monday. I, I, I risk I've been accused of talking too much, which I'm not usually accused of. Um, <laughs> um, um, I don't know, I, I think Ali has hit on it, it's the information. I find it astounding that people in Danoon, all of 12 miles from Coolport, don't seem to understand they could be in fact completely vaporised yeah. by an accident there. But I was in the Holy Loch in the late 1980s when every shellfish in that loch died. I know that the incidence of non hodgkins lymphoma and throat cancers in this area reached eight times the national incidence. Mm -hmm. But how many people in Danoon in this area actually know any of this? And it's how to get the information out to people. But the, I talked to a doctor about this and he said, yes, that's correct. The only other place that is a similar pocket is around Sawcoach and Drossen. And I said, Sawcoach and Drossen? Interesting. There's this non hodgkins lymphoma, and I think everybody in this room has probably seen people walking around this town to things up the nose and the throat cancers and all the rest of it. So it's how to actually get the information out to the people in face of a biased press, and uh, I think that's what we should be actually addressing. Yep. I think <coughs> it's astounding that people in this area don't recognise what is among them. Do you remember the American uh, commander actually wrote to the Danoon Observer? <coughs> front page and said do not touch the bottom of this lock at the point in which they were talking about cleaning the lock up which we knew was a lie they were looking for something and that was front page of the <coughs> the last commander of the base said leave the bottom of the lock alone yes you know? i know exactly what happened at the time um, at that time there was very strong scientific advice given from a guy called Graham Shamil, who mm -hmm. was the director of this, the, the, the Green Laboratory at the staff outside Robin, 
then Graham said, don't touch it yes. under any circumstances. And in fact, he was lambasted mm. for weeks and months by Councillor Wall, mm. the leader of the council, mm. because they wanted to clean it up. Mm. As it happens, eh, nothing, as far as we know, catastrophic has happened, but we don't know what kind of lower level damage has been caused. Yes? It's a uh, slightly off topic, we say on the same stream. If uh, we actually manage to achieve this ideal goal of scrapping Trident and the danger it poses to us, is it within the scope of this movement that we'd stop nuclear power or do we not or do you not see that as much of a threat? Because in my view, as long as there are nuclear power plants, there is the ability to create weapon based plutonium. And there will never truly be a reassurance that our government will not go back on its promise or any government until the ability to create weapons based plutonium is eradicated. Yeah, either of you like to respond? Yeah, no, I, I think Jeremy was quite saying there's quite a few who are opposed to nuclear power. Um, and we just have to keep in mind things in Scotland. In the political situation in Scotland, it does seem to be quite strong opposition in that the role of realistic proposing to open the nuclear power system. The, the link to nuclear weapons is possibly slightly more complex now in that they actually they already have the stocks. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, kind of the screen is a bit more tricky. Um, almost certainly, this stuff is still coming from the States. So the island is uranium, so the submarines are nuclear armed, but they're also nuclear power. So they need high-enriched uranium on an ongoing basis to fuel the submarines. Um, and it's 98% enriched, it's difficult to get hold of. Um, and I think that bit of the system is dependent on the constant supply. The plutonium, the, the recycle, you know, the take plutonium out of the bottom to use in the US. But it's, it's, it's undoubtedly the case that you just like, you know. <coughs> I don't know if everybody knows that just a few days ago, a law was passed in Parliament about nuclear waste. Yeah. And does everybody know about that? Yeah, it's been done. Uh, that in fact, just before the before it was cut, very quietly, without any public debate at all, a law was passed to allow the government to uh, dump nuclear waste, buy nuclear waste anywhere in the country that they want to, and local authorities will not have any say in this whatsoever. <laughs> so that's the latest. Very quiet, so it's moving. And that's all the nuclear waste in the last 50 years. Weapons, medical waste, and nuclear power stations. Well, just back to the NATO thing in the SNP, I'm from the Hill, I'm an SNP member. Um, I watched the voting, and that was an exciting day on the, 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 the best debate the SNP ever had, I think, and I noticed that the First Minister then, Alex Zaman, voted for it. There's quite a lot of pressure to vote for it, I think, in, in that day. But looking at the change of leadership now to Nicola Sturgeon, she'll be her own person, but at the, the, this conference, the last conference there, it was the most exciting. There was a different atmosphere. There was loads of young people there and with the membership increasing, they're going to be under, I think the SNP are going to be uh, under pressure to change the thinking, the, the old traditional SNP thinking. And looking at that conference with the young people there that were standing up, things going on, and it, it was an amazing change. So I think the change is going to come with the new leader and the new mem the massive uh, membership they've got. I think there'll be a lot of talk about it, I think they would look at it again, I don't know. It's, it's always good to hear an optimistic view. Wow. <laughs> 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 Anyone else this lady here? Yeah. Um, just speaking to one, do you Because the, they probably don't do that. I don't know how this is going to work. This is going to 
If you look at the history of the Russian nuclear deal, they've had about every conceivable form of accident, including this I was exploding in something like Sinki. This is the kind of the kind of the Russian of the Russian of the of the Russian the, 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 the number and scale of the incidents in the of Russia is less, but nevertheless, and just in terms of a, a risk approach, these things are all possible. You know, the most serious types of accidents can actually happen here. And there are certainly very large numbers of accidents at the, at the lower level. And one of the more recent sums of work with Rob Edwards on is the, the number of these low level incidents happen badly is increasing. Because there actually are, are more of these things. Which <coughs> there's all sorts of rules and regulations any time they reach those and have to them. And that's happening more. And uh, some of the reports were basically showing problems with safety problems. Um, basically, the, the, there are two major sides. One is the ship lift. The ship lift, ship lift lifts a kind of something out of the water, the water with its missiles aboard. What we know is if an aircraft falls out of the sky and hits that structure when there is a something, it is assumed that the something will collapse and there is then a trigger series of events which ends up in the special region of the um, Now, they then say that you don't have to worry about that. There's a chance of a, an aircraft accidentally falling out of the sky and should be this. You know, it's like the chance of an aircraft falling out of the sky and it's here. very remote. What that doesn't then take into account clearly is the possibility of something deliberately flies out of the aircraft and that sort of thing. And I suspect with the cool portion, it's called the Panther Jetty, eh, the risks are higher. But unfortunately, can't get the equipment risk assessments because everything around the report is just far more sensitive. The ship lift is actually more close to the details and assessments are completed. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, Stephen, I just got up the road from Dunoon and I confess that we actually moved to Dunoon by choice about uh, 15 years ago. We thought, where's the safest place to be in Scotland? <laughs> 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 no, seriously, no, I don't think I gave it a second job that would be right next to Fast Lane. And to be honest with you, if there was a serious incident here, again, it doesn't really concern me that uh, it would be the first ones to be wiped out. But what does concern me is that there's so many nuclear warheads. Uh, focused on one of the major cities in the world, namely Moscow, that's news to me. And uh, I must admit, I thought that the nuclear weapons that we had were just floating around in the oceans, ready to be deployed in the event that there was an attack. But it's clear <coughs> to know that the, the, these warheads were actually intended for a purpose. Uh, and it's certainly not my intention, it would never be my intention. And I'm sure that most people in Scotland would not be want to be an aggressive force, an aggressor towards another country. It's one thing in, in defence, but quite another being an aggressor. I just want to say that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> uh, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the coming general election. Don't they have the referendum? But the various groups significant membership, for example, of the Labour for Independence. Uh, and it seems to me that some, in some cases, including many of these proposals that are coming out from the Unionist forces are worth serious consideration. Is there any way in which we could encourage even a small number of significant people in the Unionist forces to do a a no nuclear status. So although the party stands officially would be so and so, some of these serious candidates for election would be taken to the public vote. And in terms of moving around this election, it's quite complicated. So some of the better ones are in North Asia and are advocating to speak to the demo. 
And actually, even getting rid of them might be one of the options. You know, we want alternatives, and the alternatives include not having them. Whereas, um, that debate in January in the House of Commons, we just wanted the ones saying, well, it's all changed now, you know, these alternatives aren't viable anymore. We've, we've got to have the nuclear power. The, 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 new, the, the Liberal Democrats in Nagal and Butte have always supported Baslane and Coolport in defiance of the party's position. That's because it gets them elected you know, to Westminster here. This is our big problem in this seat is the Hillsborough Conurbation, which is the biggest population in Nagal and Butte, and continually votes to save the base. And it's a saving the base, and the base is of wrong information. The, the 22,000 or 400,000 people work there, or the whole population of the whole of Argyll works, you know, it's all nonsense, but this, this is it. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan Reid is unlikely to change that position, though he, uh, hopefully he will be in position to have no position very shortly. system requires them constantly to do routines. But, you know, they, they go out in these shows, so it's constantly something that's called for seven days at a time. They're not just sitting there putting the drums. They regularly get messages which are saying, prepare to launch, and somebody's standing there, how quickly can, can they do it? So they're doing the drills. They're constantly doing the drills so that they can actually launch quickly and check with all the systems so that they can do what they have to. You know, it, and if you hear the people involved in it, that's for them to say, well, we'll just have them, but not be ready to use them, if they can just sit there. That doesn't work. You know, part of the whole thing about deterrence is you've got to be ready to actually do it. Um, but it's pretty scary that, you know, we don't just possess the weapons, we've actually got them there on patrol with, you know, where they quite be the targets. The targets don't sit in the cell, that's what we the targets. That just means. The missile itself physically does not have to be targeted, but the targets are set in the computer nexus and the pistol button. You can assume the targets in Moscow are pointing the other way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would imagine. And here, I don't know if you've seen Dr. Strangelove. Yeah. The whole thing with Dr. Strangelove is that there's this automated system. Yeah. And that's almost what they did. They have this didn't have a semi automated system. So, and the guy in the central command goes to Russia, a number of people can automatically launch. If you look at Catch 22, we could blow our cities up and they can blow their own up. <laughs> <laughs> Save a lot of expense, wouldn't it? We can choose the events. Well, we, we do still, I mean, and I think it's just because you see these things exploding fast. Yeah. There is a sense in which we do still live in this Doctor Strange world. World. Yeah. The same sort of world on the brink of nuclear and, and you know, the hotel with the war game when we get to get Those things are still real today. They were real at the time, but they're actually just as real. Most people just aren't aware of it. But the, the Cold War systems, they, these, they, 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 they operate on minutes <coughs> warning, you know, certainly both from both Russia and America. Ourselves, we say are on days notice, but actually, the day's notice can be taken up to 15 minutes notice at any time. Just to invite the there about in a first strike weapon. I mean, those of you who remember uh, the following war, there were two quite separate theories going about. One was that the UK had persuaded the Americans to allow them to reprogram the targeting to hit 
every city in Argentina. And the other story was that the Americans, being relatively friendly with Argentina, didn't allow them to do it. So no matter what way you look, you look at it, it's just unbelievable. One is it's completely non-independent, which was part of John's point, and the other is that it becomes a first-rate weapon that would have been used if we get into big trouble, which was virtually, was virtually happened. So, well, one of the things, a lot of things just think through things through logically and in terms of software. I'm almost certain the software is at least great, so you can't get married. <laughs> because <laughs> you're, you're supplying Britain with this system, but actually you can fire the missiles in the United States, and there's nothing else, I'm pretty sure there's a wee line in there that says the missiles can fly whichever way it is west. <laughs> well, what you're actually saying is we are the protection of the United States. Yeah. We have chosen to be the target, the biggest yeah. target in the world to protect the United States. Mm -hmm. We jock gets it if it's a nuclear uh, yeah. war. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take two more questions because our speakers are going for ferries, one in the 10 to 9, one in presumably 9 to Western. So this lady here, to try to give everybody a chance. It's, it's following on a bit from what Dave was talking about from the, the health point of view. I'm just wondering what research has actually been done into like the test area and maybe down to like Helensburg. I a bit like Steve's moved my family here uh, 14 years ago because of all those and I was healthy place to bring up the young family. And you know that there's a lot of positives, but it's also over the years I've started to feel guilty, you know, like some of them like to be happy and are continuing and say don't paddle in the water, you know, it's there's because it's a big life. But I grew up in East Berlin, the big town, I went to a big school there, and I cannot think of my entire childhood of knowing of a child that contracted or died of cancer. Living in this town, it's a regular occurrence. Childhood cancer. You know, it's, it's, and, and, you know, I might just because I work in the health industry, I, I see it a little bit more, but I don't think so because I like to say I grew up in a big town, went to a big school, can't think of, you know, a single child and during that time of time cancer. But it, it's a, a sad way of just getting through the current I'm just wondering if anybody's actually compiled proper statistics because that's, that's something that I think is important to <coughs> Well, the, the health boards do compile these things, but there are often other factors that they will attribute to particular clusters of disease. So, hard to, hard to say. Alistair. Um, it's just to bring you back in an idea earlier before we leave the room, if we can actually get something coordinated around TNG, so we can actually have a little branch here. Mm -hmm. um, we can actually, if there's a central point, then we can actually collate this information and find out where we need it. Well, so I think in a practical sense, if there's a small group of three or four people, you know, you've got a list of all the names of people. Well, you know, we've got a very big list of names, haven't we? Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, we, we certainly there would be no problem at all with the forward shop being in fact the centre of getting a C and D group together. I mean, we've got a big loop of hundreds on our loop, and you know, there would certainly be no problem at all advertising and building something together. Mm -hmm. No problem at all. I think I have to say most people in the, in 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 our area of operation would be very very keen to be involved. In that. So what would the con? How would that be done, John? If you well, if, to if you can touch the office, the other slight involved thing, which is a part of the it, it, it's like the wee bit Scottish CMT membership as well. Uh, well, if, if I can get all the information from you, I'll make sure it's well displayed. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Can't. I mean, people being poisoned by by the system. I 
mean, this is the thing for me with Trident, is that this isn't a single issue. Trident isn't just one thing, it's not just like one demand that you can get rid of that, because it cuts across every single argument. It's about austerity, it's about international relations, it's about Scotland having the capacity for a bright, civilised future, whether that's energy or health, all these things are encapsulated in Trident. It all comes down to, to this as like being one of the major overarching things. And just like on the general election, um, I know that there's like some MPs, well, respected MPs, um, who are making warmer noises to have an, uh, an anti tribal position. Um, there are good MPs like Kate Clark, who has consistently voted against tribal anti austerity as well. My concern about this is that that's not the direction of Scottish Labour because for the leadership of John Murphy, the investiture of McTernan, I mean these these are two men who are not going to try and undo the new Labour European project of building links with America. Mm. They're not I can't ever see that happening. And John Murphy might be given off soft things, but I have no doubts about it. This is a man who's driven by militaristic instincts. And McTerran, of course, being an unapologetic Blairite who still supports the war in Iraq. I, mean, I, I just I see that there's MP candidates who are making good noises about this. You know, Jim's trying to be quite soft on it, but what they stand for is is I mean, it's basically the opposite. And there's part of me that, that I don't quite trust the Labour Party to do anything about Trident. Even if there's a swathe of pro independent MPs who are all anti tribal that go down there, I think there has to be pressure from outside of the parliament as well. There has to be big mobilisations to make that happen. I mean, are the British elite really going to let Ed Miliband get rid of Trident without any external pressure? Because that's why I think it's important, that regardless of your political affiliations or even in the none, that there is, there is a mass of people. We're constantly shoving us back on the agenda and making sure that we can be able to do something in the right. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I think we wind this up. I'm sorry, but like maybe to give John one last word as well because again, he'd like to get the 29 pens. So, <coughs> John. No, I think that, that's all. I think we think that we've covered things largely. Um, it's just, I, I think it, it is still an exciting time of of us doing things politically. And I'm one of these folk who really enjoyed this for the same as we've got the whole time we've got the end of the campaign. But it's a simple thing for us. But there's also a feeling at the moment that we're still living in this very sort of dynamic time when the things can happen. Yeah. And it's this sense that ordinary people can actually do this. You know, we're not relying on these people behind closed doors deciding things. We can actually do what we want ourselves. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, can I just um, allow our speakers to go if we want to stay for a wee while, we can do. Um, but I just want you to give a big thanks to Cat Boyd and Johnny.